Have you ever heard this line before? No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. It's a fine sounding phrase. It comes from Paul's quotation of Isaiah chapter 64 from 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 9. But usually when I hear someone use this phrase, it's deployed like a magician's puff of smoke. Uh, it goes like this. You're discussing some deep Bible truth with a Bible teacher, and you ask them a question that they can't answer. And what do they do? They kind of stroke their chin and say, Ah, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived the things of God. Um, instead of this Bible teacher saying, I don't know the answer, um, sometimes they can get all super spiritual and say, well, you can't know the answer. No mind has conceived the things of God. And suddenly ignorance is rebranded as mystery, and we are all ushered away from the scene of the controversy rather quickly. But that is not what Paul in 1 Corinthians 2 or Isaiah meant in Isaiah chapter 64, when he said, no eye has seen, no ear has heard. Let me quote to you Isaiah chapter 64, verse 4, and we'll see the origin of this phrase. Isaiah says, Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. Here is the thing which no eye has seen, a living God. In a world full of gods who claim to be gods, there's only one true God. And the mark of this one true God is this. He works and his people wait. Every other God out there waits while their people work. They sit back on their thrones, distant and waiting to be impressed, waiting to be served. Human religion has humans working and the gods waiting. Isaiah says that the real God is the one who works while we wait. He acts on behalf of those who wait for him. It is the total reverse. Human religion has humans working for a waiting God. The Bible has God working for his waiting people. Human religion has humanity center stage, doing it all, while God idly watches. The gospel has God kind of shooing us off stage. He seats us in the audience to watch him work salvation for us. And all we can do is watch. All we can do is wait. That's what marks him out as the true God, the living God. And this is what no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived. This is what is utterly unique. The living God acts on behalf of those who wait for him. Why does he do it that way? Well, we all know the phrase, if you want a job, job done properly, you do it yourself, right? Well, that's what he has said earlier in Isaiah, just a few chapters earlier. Isaiah writes this, chapter 59 and verse, uh, chapter 59 and verse 15, the Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm worked salvation for him and his own righteousness sustained him. Again, it's this case. If you want a job done right, you do it yourself. That seems to be the Lord's philosophy. So his own arm works salvation for him. We've already met the arm of the Lord in Isaiah chapter 53 verse 1. The arm of the Lord is the king who became the servant, who became the sacrifice, the lamb who was led to the slaughter. Christ is God's arm who works salvation for him. Jesus comes into our world, into our humanity, and he is God the Son doing human life for us in our place and on our behalf. He lived the life that we should die, uh, we should live, and then he died the death that we should die. He rose again to new life and he has ascended to the Father as our perfect sacrifice and priest. As the arm of the Lord, he does it all. And he scoops us up into his Father's presence. What marks out the living God from all other pretenders is this. God himself. God himself. He is not like the Bible teacher who tries to deflect us from prying into his character. You know, when we ask, hey, God of the Bible, what makes you so different? He doesn't just say, ah, I am ineffably sublime. I am transcendently transcendent. I am beyond all imagining. 
you know, he is all those things, but in what way is he so very different? How does he show himself to be so far beyond all other imagined gods? Well, here is the one God who works while we wait. Here is the truly transcendent God. The, 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 the God who is transcendent in love is the God who is the living God, the true God, the God who no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived of a God who stoops, serves, suffers, bleeds and dies for helpless, wicked enemies like us. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived of a God like Jesus. Mm -hmm.